everybody. I was just sitting in the garden by the fountain listening to the bells. I hope that uh, you're able to find a peaceful place, and I'm glad that you've come here to worship our Lord with us this morning. I pray that the peace of Christ would be with you and also with you. Thanks for joining us, everybody. thought for prayer today that we would retreat to a little peaceful place that even if you go to this church uh, in person, many of you have never seen before. Uh, this is a utility closet, and there are windows in here, stained glass windows from 1905, as you as you see right next to me, because because uh, this sanctuary was re or this whole church was redone, and this whole building used to be. A part of the sanctuary so these windows uh, that you see here would have you know gone would have gone all the way around um, and so you would have originally seen these uh, the way the building was before um, but you don't see them now unless you come in this closet and it's an appropriate thing for prayer because sometimes we all just need to retreat to a little quiet place and look to the cross of Christ and heal the poison that's traveling around in our veins, right? Um, and that's what we're doing today. Of course, we welcome uh, your prayer concerns and your prayer requests. Um, we'd, we'd love to hear from you. Um, pastor at FCCPalestine.org, uh, we'd love to, um, to hear from you that way. Also, uh, don't forget that we're uh, meeting uh, digitally um, after the service today. Uh, the link's right here, and it'll be in the it'll be in the in the show notes as well, so you can um, so you can see those. Um, we want to, of course, uh, keep praying for our uh, for our doctors and our nurses as they um, try to keep up um, for for the world as it tries to normalize to all this and figure out how to move forward. Um, we also uh, kids will be starting back to school soon, some in person and some not. Uh, and man, it is a difficult time to be a teacher. It's also a very difficult and uncertain time to be a student. So please um, keep those um, students and uh, teachers in your prayers. And uh, we've started a uh, drive right now that we are collecting uh, masks right now. Uh, if you make masks, if you uh, if you have um, some extras that uh, are solid color, um, we're collecting those uh, for the uh, for the teachers and students at, at our schools. They have to have solid color masks, and so we thought we'd ease some of their burdens if you have some or you have the capability to make them 
um, we would uh, you can bring them up here to the church uh, and so that's what we're doing now to try to help out um, in that regard um, but without any further ado let's go to God in prayer oh gracious God like the windows say you are our peace you are the dove which alights in your spirit and you are the joy of the music playing as the harp suggests we hear the music from heaven in our souls when we take those quiet moments lord may we take these moments to look to you and let the poison seep out of us the poison of sin as we stare at your cross and we feel your forgiveness god we pray for those who are seeking to go back to school whether they do it online or whether they do it uh, in person again. And we pray for all those teachers and administrators who are facilitating all that. God, for all those who are sick, God, we pray for their healing. For all those doctors and nurses providing for their care, oh Lord, we pray that you would give them strength and endurance as these times are hard. For all of us who uh, are sitting at home, trying to go back to work, or go about our lives, O oh Lord, we pray that you would give us wisdom to discern what is true from what is not, discern what is true from what we feel, that we may, be not, that we may not be poisoned by the fiery serpents of the world. God, we pray all this and more. In the name of Jesus the Christ, who is the one who is lifted up, the one who forgives all, the one who heals all, and the one who raises the dead. In his name we pray. Amen. The people spoke against Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent poisonous serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it on a pole. And whenever the serpent bit someone, that person would look at the serpent of bronze and live. O oh Lord, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, you are our strength and our redeemer. I pray that my words would not only be mine, O oh God, but yours. Amen. When I was a, a kid, when I was in middle school and high school, they used to have these speakers that would come into uh, to, that that would come into our school, and they were like motivational speakers. And they would they would gather all the the kids. They would call in the loudspeaker. We're having an assembly, and we'd all file into the gym and sit in the gym. And our gym was pretty big; it was packed, you know. So there was all these kids, you know, like nine hundred kids that are that are you know sitting in the auditorium. And there would be these speakers that would come and they would they would speak to us about, you know, they have like, don't do drugs and that kind of stuff. Um, but they were always in our school. And I think this is because this was East Texas. They were all these always these evangelical Christian guys. And they couldn't say Jesus because of separation of church and state and the fact that it was like public schools and stuff like that. And they couldn't like pray because like prayer in schools, unless they got a student to come up there and do it. Um, but they would come and they would give these speeches and they would talk. And they would always invite you to this kind of rally that they were having. Um, this rally that you were having uh, after the event. So they would come there at the school and get the school to let them in and talk to you. So they can invite you to this, this event later where it was like a full-on worship service. And uh, I went to a bunch of those when I was a kid because I would, I would hang out with, my, uh, hang out with uh, all my mostly Baptist friends at the time. And we would all go to these things. And uh, every one of them was pretty much the same. They always sort of 
blend in together, you know. Um, they always sort of blend in together. And uh, the guy would stand up there and he would tell you some story about, you know, how he used to be bad and how, you know, uh, Jesus saved him. He would give his testimony, you know, um, how, how Jesus saved him. And then he would, he would give you a call, like an altar call. There'd be an altar call, and there's always, like, really great music. Uh, it was very emotional. And there was always a lot of people there. They were always packed. And then they had this big altar call, and there were these big emotional moments where everybody would come down, you know, for the altar call while the, while the music was playing. And they were always, like, more than one night. They were, like, big revival kind of things. And so on the second night, every time, it, it was like every one of these things, they were all called something different, but they all followed the same model. They, they would ask you to bring all your worldly media. So this was back, guys, I'm showing my age here a little bit, when we had compact discs, when, you know, when we had CDs. You know, they don't have those anymore. Um, they, <laughs> we don't buy music on CDs anymore. But, um, but used to, you got these things, kids, that were CDs, and they were in like these little plastic things, and there were these like discs, and you stuck them in a, you stuck them in a, a CD player. Um, and before that, we had we had uh, we had tapes, and you stuck the tape in there, and you had to rewind it and everything. So they would tell you to bring all your tapes, and all your posters, and all your CDs, and all your you know your magazines and your books that were worldly, you know, that had like bad influences. They would tell you, you know all this bad, how this media polluted your soul, and if you, you know, really wanted to, to give yourself over to Jesus, then you needed to purge all these things. And so at the second night, or the third night sometimes, at these, these big revival things, there would be all these kids with, like, CDs and posters of, like, you know, Metallica and ACDC and Iron Maiden and all, like, the devil's music, you know? And they would come and they would have these big handfuls of this stuff and they would bring it up at the altar call and throw it in the trash. You know, they'd have like a trash can or something. Um, and as, as a kid at the time whose dad raised me to, to be, a mom and dad raised me to be a critical thinker, that always made me really uncomfortable because it seemed a bit like a Nazi book burning to me. I was like, hmm. This isn't, uh, this isn't, shouldn't we be teaching people not to, like, get away from all that stuff, but to know how to parse what is true from what is not, instead of isolating ourselves from all these things that are, quote-unquote, evil or bad influences, shouldn't we be learning how to live in the midst of those things? I just had sort of a different view of those. And so some of my friends would, like, bring their CDs and stuff, but, you know, I never really did. Uh, even though I agreed with a lot of what those guys were saying at the time, that always, you know, made me uncomfortable. But I do think my brother threw away some CDs one time. And my brother got saved like eight times at those things. He went to like eight different ones and he came down, you know, <laughs> each one. But I think, I'm pretty sure my brother gave his life to Jesus eight different times uh, at those things. Um, but... Now that, you know, now that I think about it and now that I'm older, especially as the, the media environment has grown, I really kind of see some of the stuff that those guys are talking about because one of our biggest problems, you know, that we have, that we've seen during this whole crisis, and especially that we have as Christians who are believing people, you know, and we want to believe in the name of Jesus. We want to, we want to believe. Um, it is it has become really uh, obvious to me how much we are just manipulated and willing to follow these sort of rabbit holes, you know, down the media. And I think that there might be, uh, this might be a good time and a good opportunity for us as Christians to talk about how we interact and engage with media. Um, I am never going to, you know say, we need to burn those books or we need to burn those things because one of my favorite bands has always been Iron Maiden and it will still be Iron Maiden um, even though some of their lyrics are a little brrr, but I know how to know what's godly and what's not, you know. Um, I always thought that that would be the approach is let's teach our kids and let's teach ourselves what's godly and what's not so that when we're exposed to other influences we don't have to totally shut them off but we know 
that that's what's godly and, and, and what's not. We have trained ourselves to be critical, but, but to be in the world and not of it, as Reinhold Niebuhr would say, who, by the way, was a German and was not a fan of book burnings. Um, so one of the things that I immediately thought about when, when we have these conversations uh, about media, when we're thinking about media, is there's this weird story in Numbers in the Bible, okay? And you're going to think, what does Numbers, which is a book of the Bible, by the way, what does the book of Numbers, this book that many people don't read, uh, have to do with the media? So, so hear me out. So this takes place, this story takes place when Moses and the Israelites have escaped from Egypt, okay? And remember when they escaped from Egypt after they crossed the Red Sea, they are lost in the wilderness, okay? So they're like wandering around the desert, okay? And what do people do when they're lost? They complain, right? That's what they do. That's how human beings are. They complain. Um, just like in these times, it's so different for us. Our world is so different. And none of us really know what to do or how to navigate it. We're sort of lost um, in, in, in a figurative sense because we don't know where we're going or how to get where we want to be. Um, and and, and so, so there's lots of complaining. Right? And so the Israelites complain. Um, and Moses keeps telling the people, you know, hey, let's trust God. The reason we're lost in the first place and the, and the reason that we are in this mess is because we haven't trusted God. Let's trust God and we'll be okay. And the Israelites keep blaming God for their problems. No, it's God's fault that we're here. It's your fault that we're here. We can't be this way. La, 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 la. So the Bible says that fiery snakes come out and start biting the people. Fiery snakes come out and start biting the people and poisoning them. Sounds really bad, right? Fiery snakes. So when you think fiery snakes, like you probably, like me, your first image in your head is like a snake that's on fire. And it's like, you know, slithering on the ground on fire, it sounds terrifying. Um, but it probably is their way of saying something that's like really poisonous, like fiery, like a fire ant. Like fire ants aren't on fire, but when they burn you, when they bite you, it burns, it hurts. So probably fiery snakes are like their word for some really poisonous snake that lives in the desert. Um, and so there are these really poisonous snakes that come out and start biting the people, and it poisons them, and a lot of them start dying, you know, of this, of this poison, these snakes. And it makes total sense on one hand, one, that people would complain when they're lost. That's just kind of, in my experience, how people are. Um, so it even, it makes the story a lot more believable, uh, if you know people. Two, um, if people are lost in the wilderness and, like, camping in tents in the desert, of course snakes are going to come and bite you, right? There's snakes everywhere, right? And so when you get a bunch of people with all their stuff that they're carting around the desert and they start having food and stuff like that, the snakes are going to come and they're going to bite you, right? And so the Bible says, though, that God is punishing these people um, for, their, for their doubt and, and for their complaining about everything with, by having these fiery snakes bite them. And, and so the people as they're poisoned and as they suffer from this poison, um, they, they come to Moses and they say, Moses, please help us. We're sorry. We, we blamed all this on God. Would you please do something about this? And so Moses goes to God and says, God, we, the people say they're sorry. We need to fix this. How are we going to fix this? Okay. And God gives the weirdest answer. Now, you know, God, God is not like us. God is mysterious. Quite frankly, from our perspective, God is weird sometimes, right? And, uh, and, and so one of the things that God tells Moses to do, he says, take a pole and put a bronze snake on it. And put it up at the top of the camp, like on a hill, every time you stop. And if the people get bit by a snake, they can look at it and they will be healed. 
what? Like, <laughs> and so Moses is like, okay, yeah, we're, we're going to do that. Moses goes against his bronze serpent, and he, like, sticks it on the pole, and he's like, okay, everybody, I need you to trust me. I need you to trust God. When you get bit by the snake, just look at this bronze serpent, and everything will be better. What? Okay, sure. I mean, I guess we'll try it, right? Um, and so it works. And so every time, the snakes are still there, by the way, right? The snakes are still there. They don't go away. They don't stop biting people. They just, when they get bit, they're like, oh, man, I got bit by a real poisonous snake. Let me go outside and look at the bronze. Okay, I'm better now. Let's go about my day, right? Um, that's it. That's the whole story. It's weird, right? Like, that's all there is. It's like this little snippet of this story um, in, in the Bible. And, like, you'd read about it, and if it wasn't so weird, you'd kind of forget about it if it wasn't mentioned later, Okay? And it's going to be mentioned later in a place that you probably are very familiar with that I'm going to tell you about in a second. But let's break down that number scripture real quick, okay? Think about it. What do snakes represent in the Bible? When you see a snake, what do, you, what do they represent? Immediately, right, you think of Garden of Eden, right? Right? Immediately you think of Garden of Eden, okay? And there a snake tricked Adam and Eve into doing something they weren't supposed to. But snakes also, so snakes represent sin, but snakes also represent a particular kind of sin, okay? They don't just represent any sin. They usually represent sins that have to do with craftiness, with intelligence. Because the snake in Adam and Eve's story was smart, it got them to believe stuff that was plausible to believe. And so snakes represent a kind of nefarious sin that like when we're convinced that we're doing the right thing or, or we really think we're on the right path, but we're actually not. Because that's what happened to Adam and Eve, right? They thought, they didn't think like they were doing anything wrong because they had rationalized the sin away. And that's what snakes tend to represent. Uh, they, they represent the kinds of sins that, like, don't seem that wrong. Might not be that kind of wrong. But they are poisonous. It poisons you. And so Moses, God's solution to this was like, let me tell you this answer. Look at my snake, my shiny snake. And when you see that snake, when you see my level of craftiness, the way I've crafted the world... You will not be let that other crafty poison kill you, that poison of sin kill you. Because it's not that craftiness is bad, it's a particular kind of wisdom. Even Jesus calls snakes wise. Jesus says, you are to be as Christians, you are to be as wise as serpents, but as innocent as doves. So God tells Moses to hold up this bronze snake, my wisdom. So look at my wisdom, because there's plenty of other wisdom out there that's biting you. But that other wisdom out there is biting you, and it is poisoning you. Or as Paul would say, the wisdom of the world is foolishness, right? There's all this kind of stuff that will poison you. Fast forward to today. I don't see any fiery snakes coming around biting us. But there indeed are fiery snakes. And you know where they come from? They come through your internet. They come through your cable. They come through your phone. They come through your radio. These fiery snakes that slither into our ears. Like you think I don't read the stuff you post on Facebook, right? I see that stuff, guys. You think I don't see the stuff you post on Instagram. And I'm not talking about like, oh, we're partying, having fun, or whatever. Okay, whatever. I'm talking about the stuff, man. It just There's craziness on there. And I'm like, oh, that's a fiery snake. Oh, 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 oh. I know, I know you're wise, sir. I know you're supposed to be wise, honey, but you just got bit by a fiery snake. And, like, I notice it in myself. I'm not any, I am not immune from being bit by fiery snakes. You know, I'll read something, I'll read a tweet, 
You know, I'll see something on Facebook and I'll be, I'll be like, mm, I feel that poison. And you know, it feels good. It feels right. It feels right. And I get all mad and I get all complaining. And I'm like, mm, this feels so good, but I know it's fiery snake poison. I got some fiery snake poison in my veins. Or I'll watch a news program, I'll watch a media program that's actually not news. Most news isn't news. It's entertainment masquerading as news, okay? And so we watch the news a lot of time to entertain ourselves, but the most entertaining kind of news is the kind of news we already want to hear. You don't watch news that disagrees with you because it doesn't, it's not fun. You watch the news that you agree with because it's like going to church and you go to your poison snake church and you sit down in your poison snake pew and you go, Amen! That's what I want to hear. These people are bad, or that person's bad, or all these people are bad, or they're all evil. Yes, because I am the righteous one. And you're nodding your head just like you're in church. Mm-hmm, amen. And then you post it on Facebook because you feel so good about it. Amen. And really, you just got played by the Iranians. You just got played by the Russians. You just got played by the Chinese or whatever political group is throwing around money to get you to play their game. And they just poison snaked you. And we're Christians, guys. And they're taking advantage of what we want to believe, of our good nature. Because we're not being wise as serpents but innocent as doves. Because we love that snake poison. I love it. You do too. But you know, as a wise man once said, we love sin, but we hate its consequences. The world we live in today is the consequence of our snake poison lives. So where's our bronze snake on the pole? What are we going to look at? To heal ourselves of the snake poison. Because snakes are there. They ain't going away. They're going to bite us. John chapter 3. Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert. So the son of man must be lifted up. You know that was in John chapter 3? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God didn't come into the world to condemn the world but to save it. Jesus Christ himself compared himself to that snake on a pole, that weird obscure story. He says, I am the snake, the good one, the right wisdom. Look at me and be healed and feel that poison drain away. How can you be poisoned when you look into the face of Christ. When you see the Son of Man lifted up and you look at Him dying at the cross of Calvary on the hill of Golgotha, can you look at Him saying, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do? And what's that do to that poison? Oh, gosh. I don't feel so good anymore. I don't feel so righteous anymore. You know, my first, my first real foray into intense prayer was when somebody told me that if you take everything that's said in the theory of general relativity seriously, that means that all times are happening at once, right? Especially to God, and if God is eternal... It means that Jesus Christ is dying on the cross for you right now. Jesus is on the cross in all times and in all places. And that's how that one death can cover all your sins. And so at any moment, all you have to do is look to the cross of Christ when you feel that poison. And it does something to you when you do that. When you're feeling self-righteous, when you're feeling angry, when you're feeling lonely, when you are feeling sad, there is the Savior, the Son of Man, lifted up, dying for you. And that does something to the poison. The first 
first time I experienced that, I, it's almost like I saw, almost like a portal. It was like swirling. And I just saw Christ on the hill of Golgotha. And I just wept. And it wasn't like totally sad. And it wasn't totally happy. It's hard to quantify what emotion that was. When I stared into the eyes of Christ and wept. Like a child. And there are those eyes of compassion. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And so I get bit all the time by the fiery serpents in our world. They come through my phone. They come through my computer. They come through in conversations that I have with others. They come through, and they bite me, and they poison me. Sometimes they make me mad at others. Sometimes they make me mad at the general world or just like those people, which happen to never be me. And when I feel that poison and I realize in my mind, oh, that's fiery snake poison because I know it now. I look to the cross of Christ. Just like those Israelites in the desert look to that bronze serpent on a staff and the poison goes away because I know that I am loved by Christ and I know that the people who are saying that crazy poison snake stuff are loved by Christ as much as I would really like them not to be and the poison goes away Christ died for all of us for you and for me and for them and so when you feel that poison and when you feel inclined to go to the church of the poison snake just look to Christ on Calvary and see if that doesn't change your mind see if that doesn't change the way you feel It is the good news of the gospel. It is the word of the Lord that the Son of Man was lifted up as Moses lifted up that snake. And he did not come into the world to condemn it, but to save it.
embrace a time in our service where we share with one another communion. So if you'll go and grab your elements. On the night in which our Lord was betrayed, before he would be lifted up, as Moses lifted up the serpent, he gathered with his disciples in the upper room and he took the bread. And after he blessed it, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. And in the same way, he also took the cup after supper and he said, This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for the forgiveness of your sins. For as often as you eat my body and you drink my blood, you proclaim my death until I come again. Will you pray with me, please? Lord, I pray that these elements, this body and this blood, would be your body and your blood for us that they would help us to absorb the poisons of the fiery serpents which swarm and swirl all around us, and that we would be able to look to your cross and be purged of all poisons and think rightly with your wisdom, with mercy and compassion. As these elements come into us, may your same mercy flow through our veins and nourish our bodies. We pray this all in the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. The body of Christ, which is broken for you. The blood of Christ, shed for the forgiveness of your sins. Thanks be to God. Thanks for joining us, everybody. We really appreciate you coming and, and worshiping with us today. As always, I pray that you have a good week. And of course, also, I pray that the peace of Christ would guard your hearts and minds. And I pray that the Lord would bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you and give you peace and grace both now and in the life to come. Amen. See you next week, everybody.